Okay, let's talk about cardiac output. Let's get the math out of the way right away. Cardiac output is usually expressed in liters per minute, or it could be milliliters per minute. And it's equal to stroke volume, which is milliliters per beat, kind of small l, milliliters per beat. And we take that times heart rate, which is beats per minute. So that's how we get this liters per minute or milliliters per beat is we're multiplying stroke volume times heart rate. And that makes sense from the point of view of a pump. The heart is a pump, obviously, and any pump is going to basically how much blood it pumps or how much a pump pumps is determined by how much it pumps per cycle and how fast it cycles. If we're talking about a real human heart, then generally stroke volume is 70 milliliters per beat it up here times a normal heart rate might be 70 beats per minute and that gives us a normal cardiac output of 4.9 liters per minute or 4900 milliliters per minute now there's more to it than just the math because we want to talk about stroke volume because there's other things that go into stroke volume and we also want to talk about the things that control heart rate so we're going to take this cardiac output and I'm just going to extend it just like this because we want to talk about issues that go into heart rate. We want to talk about issues that control stroke volume. Let's start with stroke volume because that's the hardest one. The things that go into stroke volume, the three main things are something called preload. I'm giving myself a little space here because I'm going to add some stuff in. Contractility. And afterload. Let's go back and define those. Preload is a quality of heart muscle that's very, very special to heart muscle in that heart muscle, let's just put it this way, the more heart muscle is stretched prior to contraction, the harder it contracts. What that means is if the heart is filled with more blood, it's actually going to pump harder, which makes a lot of sense. Because if the heart is seeing more blood, it would be nice if it would respond on its own and start pumping more blood. The way that it does this, or the specific mechanism, is thought to be tied to the calcium binding site on troponin. So if you remember your muscle physiology, calcium binds to troponin, troponin pulls tropomyosin out of the way. And tropomyosin is intervening between actin and myosin. So the sequence is calcium binds to troponin, troponin pulls tropomyosin out of the way, so actin and myosin can interact in contraction. So the leading theory is that binding site for calcium actually stretches a little when the muscle stretches itself, so it becomes larger. So if muscle stretches, the calcium binding site stretches, it's easier for calcium to bind to troponin and cause this whole sequence to occur. This is called Starling's principle, if you want to look it up. Contractility means... The heart can contract at different strengths. That's unique to heart muscle as well. You take a normal skeletal muscle fiber and you just look at an individual fiber. It's got two speeds. It's either contracting or it's not. Heart muscle, on the other hand, always reminds me of spinal tap because heart muscle can go to 11. Heart muscle can actually contract at several speeds or strength, if you prefer. Afterload is resistance to blood leaving the heart. So the heart is trying to pump blood out. What are the things that are pushing back? That's what afterload is. And again, the theory here is that the heart is trying to pump out a stroke volume. If that blood is pushing back, that's going to decrease the stroke volume, and that's afterload. I think we'll go back through this again. 
And this time we'll point out some of the things that affect preload contractility in After 